So uh, as the, the organizers of this talk know, I, uh, I changed the title of my talk a couple of times. Um, so uh, I'm essentially here to talk to you about user tracking on e-resource platforms. Really, I want to talk to you about privacy. Um, one of the, the great things about working in libraries is that I get to care about privacy. Um, it's one of our, our core professional values. Um, you know, we point to the, the ALA code of ethics. The library users have a right to keep their interests private, their reading habits private. Um, so as Sunshine mentioned, I am a librarian. Um, I got my uh, MLIS from the Dominican program when it was here at St. Kate's. Um, I am not an e-resource librarian. Um, I'm lucky to work with uh, many talented e-resource librarians, but I'm not one. Um, I've spent the past 15 plus years working on the web, so I want to start by uh, start this talk with a discussion of privacy and the web. Now, I know that librarians are a well-informed bunch, so I suspect you're aware of how privacy on the web has been in the news for the past couple of years. And when it comes to privacy, the web, it's not great. Um, the web has, has really turned into sort of a panopticon, a surveillance state, where the very behavior that librarians believe should be kept private, your information seeking, your reading, uh, is often the price of access. Why is that? Um, the reason is because the web has, has become dominated not by the academics and cat lovers of years past, but by giant advertising companies, marketing companies, retailers who are hell-bent on collecting the broadest, deepest possible set of information on people so that they can sell ads, so that they can market. Um, you may have heard the, uh, I think, probably unintentionally creepy slogan, data is the new oil. Um, I think that's truer than people may have intended when they first uh, coined that phrase. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about how we got here. Um, anyone here from Target? All right, cool. Um, so uh, I want to give an example of the value of data. Um, and this is something that I suspect many of you will be uh, familiar with because it, it uh, was in the, the national news, and there's nothing that um, Minnesota media likes more than a national story that they can get a local spin on. So there's an article in the New York Times Magazine in uh, 2012 um, about big data and retail um, by a man named Charles Duhigg. And in it was this incredible anecdote. And it's so incredible that I question its, its veracity, but we're going to run with it because it was printed in the New York Times Magazine. Um, and and this, article, this anecdote was about an enraged man who walked into his local Target store, demanded to see the manager, and confronted the manager about why, he wanted to know why his teenage daughter was receiving coupons at their home addressed to her for maternity products. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll, I'll cut to the chase and say that uh, it turns out she was in fact pregnant, and that Target knew before her father did. Um, and the, the, this is what this, the New York Times Magazine story was about. It was about how Target had optimized its data collection um, process around these sort of major life events because they knew that that's when there's an opportunity to change someone's brand loyalty, some, to change their shopping habits and things like that. And it was a very important moment for Target to be there and to be there first. Sometimes a little too soon, but first. Um, and so this is a quote from that, that article. They, they're able to analyze shopping data and see that when someone suddenly starts buying lots of scent-free soap and extra big bags of cotton balls, in addition to hand sanitizers and washcloths, it signals they could be getting close to their delivery date. And so that's when they'll start sending out uh, those personalized coupons. So how did they do it? Um, how did they know who purchased what? How did they know where to target those coupons? Um, it's, a, it's something that seems very quaint now, and this was only in 2012, but they were buying mailing lists. They were sending out personalized coupons um, so that when you used one of those coupons, they were able to attribute a purchase to your address, um, and then they were able to track purchasing habits that way. It was paper um, in, in large part. Um, so as I said, that, that even though that was an example of how creepy uh, big data retail can be, it seems very quaint now. Four years later, we had already gotten to the point where Kelly Burns, who's a professor of advertising and mass communication at the University of South Florida, um, caused a stir when she went on a local news program and admitted that Facebook's ad targeting had gotten so good 
that she couldn't rule out that Facebook was listening to its users, actually listening, active microphones and parsing your speech and figuring out what you were talking about. The truth of Facebook's advertising targeting is a little simpler because now we provide these data points willingly. The same data points that Target was um, data mining and used, sending out coupons and things like that to find, we provide now um, to, to Facebook in a lot of cases. Now, I don't, uh, we make choices. Uh, we're all grown-ups here. We make choices about the information that we provide to Facebook and other uh, companies, other social networks. Um, we provide them details about our lives and our habits uh, that help make their services more useful to us. Uh, life events, demographic information. We let them train their algorithms on our email um, because we get an excellent user experience in return. We let them scan our books, knowing that we in libraries and our users get something in return. This is a, a screenshot from HathiTrust, which is the repository that a bunch of the libraries who are participants in Google's book scanning project use to house the copies that we get as part of that agreement. But this information that we provide to these companies willingly, it turns out is not enough for their needs. So Google is the biggest advertising company in the world. That is their business. Um, that fact is not so clearly represented in their mission statement here. Um, and I'll, uh, this will be the first of a number of slides. I don't expect you to read them. I'll read relevant bits. I know that the, the type is kind of small. Um, but I'm just gonna read the first couple of lines here. Um, our mission, from the beginning, our mission has been to organize the world's information and make it universally accessible and useful. So as librarians, it's easy to see this in a really positive light. We love organizing information, right? We care about accessibility. We want to make information useful. But I'd like to suggest a slightly different reading. When I said the world's information, I'm afraid that what you heard was a lot of information. What I said was the world's information. <laughs> All of it. The incentives for these companies are aligned such that they want to know our every move, our every purchase, our every click, and the information that we offer up knowingly is not enough. So how do they get that information? That's what I want to talk to you about today. So the simplest way that companies gather additional information about uh, what we do, anybody here from Best Buy? <laughs> All right, cool. Um, is something really simple and not new, old technology, cookies. Um, so the uh, simplest example of what a cookie is, is when you come to a site and uh, you click the box that says, keep me signed in, what the website is gonna do is gonna store a little bit of data in your web browser that connects to your user account in their system. And so the next time you come back to their site, you're logged right back in again, you don't have to remember your password, um, and you get back to uh, where you were with the items in your cart or your purchase history or whatever. Um, this also benefits the retailer because they are able to know every time you come back to their site who you are. And they're able to build this longitudinal picture of your browsing habits, your purchase habits, across different sessions, across days, across years in some cases. Nope, wrong way. Um, here's an example, and again, I'll, I'll point out the, the relevant information here. So this is um, from the Star Tribune uh, website yesterday. Um, and uh, I don't know if everyone's familiar with this window that I have sitting over my web browser here, but this is the, the dev tools or the inspector. This is in Chrome. It's something that's available to everyone who uses a web browser like this. And you can go in here and look at the cookies that are being set uh, by the, the website that you're visiting. And so I just want to point out here, this highlighted row um, is a cookie that is being set by the Star Tribune site. Um, it, and you can see its name, CFD UID, user ID, um, and it's this long, random, unique number. But I also want to point out that I'm not logged in here. I did not ask them to remember who I am. And nevertheless, they're setting a cookie in my browser here that's going to persist until next October. Um, 
And so that every time I come back to this site uh, with this cookie in my browser, they're going to be able to recognize who I am and be able to string together the history of the browsing that I do on, on their site. It's also worth noting here that the Star Tribune is also offering up my reading habits to dozens of advertisers and networks of advertisers. Every URL that you see here uh, represents a third party who has code that's being loaded on this page. Every URL that you see in this window is a website or a server that can see all my behavior on this page. They can see the URL of the page, they can see uh, the links that I click on, they can see my IP address. Um, you can see Facebook is here. Um, there's gonna be a whole bunch of these things that you and I may never have heard of. Ad Nexus, I can guess what that is. Sounds gross. Um, Amazon is here. Gumgum.com. I don't know who they are, but I don't know why they get to know what news I'm reading, but they do. And if I've got a cookie in my browser already from visiting Facebook or Amazon, they are able to connect my use of the Star Tribune site to my use of their site. They're able to use a consistent user ID, they're able to read the user ID and the cookies that they set when I visited Facebook or visited Amazon, and they're able to say, oh yeah, I know that guy, huh, he likes the Star Tribune, huh? And what I've showed you here in these past couple of slides is frankly the tip of the iceberg. Um, so I wanna, um, well, I'll pause for just a moment and say, uh, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about this panopticlick tool from the Electronic Frontier Foundation. I will make these slides available. All the relevant things are linked from their slides, so don't worry about uh, trying to uh, write things down. If you, I, I want your eyes up here. I want all of your attention <laughs> on, on me. Um, so I'll make these slides available uh, to the organizers, and I assume we can get them up on the website today. Um, all right, so. Uh, Panopticlick is a tool that, that I've used in trying to understand how web tracking works, um, and I, I would recommend it to you. And, and one thing that the Panopticlick site does is show you how uh, a technology called uh, browser fingerprinting works. Um, so browser fingerprinting is this really interesting idea. Um, there's a number of, of bits of information, metadata, if you will, about your web browser that it's important for a web server to know. It's, it's often important for a web server to know what browser you're using, what size window uh, your browser has so that they can render the, the website appropriately, um, what kind of fonts you might have installed so they can render the fonts appropriately. Each one of these little bits of information is not terribly interesting and not terribly identifying. But when you take all of them together, you can generate a fingerprint for your browser that can set it apart from a lot of other browsers. And as a matter of fact, I went to the Panopticlick site um, the other day using the same browser that I've used for a lot of this uh, testing and screenshots. And according to uh, their judgment, without any other information about me, without any cookies, without any user accounts, without any browsing history, my browser was in fact unique among 231,000 browsers that had visited their site. And so when you think about, okay, we can set this UID cookie, we can do this and that, but this is one more way that we can grab a piece of identifying information, and when you start to pull the pieces together, it paints a, a fairly unique picture of who I am. A site can reasonably assume that if they see this browser fingerprint again, it's probably the same user. And if they get one or two more pieces of identifying information, then they know for sure. This is not enough to collect the world's information. Um, I don't know how many of you, like me, reluctantly have a LinkedIn account. <laughs> and uh, if you use their mobile app, um, you, like me, probably get a window like this pretty much every time you, you open the app. And it's asking, so this is a, a screenshot of the LinkedIn app, and it's saying, hey, why don't you let me see your uh, address book? Why don't you let me see your contacts, and then I can see if there's anybody else you know here, um, which is handy. Um, but LinkedIn's use 
of the contact information that you provide when you sync your address book is not limited to matching against users who already have LinkedIn accounts. They store all of it. They store the information, the contact information for users who don't have LinkedIn accounts um, in case they might someday, right? Um, in case they want to sell ads, LinkedIn has a huge ad network. You will find LinkedIn ads sold, brokered by LinkedIn on many other sites. Um, and they might one day find another little piece of information that connects to someone from your address book that they're able to, to identify and build a profile. So uh, these companies, social networks, et cetera, are building profiles even for users who don't have accounts. So not only are, you know, if I uh, you know, upload my aunt's uh, contact information here and she doesn't have a LinkedIn account, not only has she not gone in to get the value out of LinkedIn of like, well, here's who I am and here's where I've worked and here's my colleagues, um, she hasn't interacted with them at all and yet they're starting to build an account, a, a profile for her behind the scenes. It's sometimes called shadow profiling. You may have heard about it before. It came up in um, congressional hearings that, uh, with Facebook. Um, So what has happened since 2012, since that charming antiquated story about Target's data collection, is that we've seen uh, two things happen. One is uh, Moore's Law, uh, which is a sort of anecdotal way to describe how computer processing power increases over time. It has become increasingly cheap and easy for companies to process and reprocess and reprocess this, this, the data that they collect to try to find trends and connect dots between little bits of information. And the other thing is cheap storage. Storage for this data has gotten cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. Ch cheap enough that it is in the interests of these companies to store every little fragmentary bit of identity that they can gather on the off chance that sometime in the future it might be reconciled and might cohere into a useful picture of an individual that they can use for ad targeting um, and things like that. That's still not enough. Because it is common practice now, um, not just for Facebooks and Googles and Amazons and things like that, but for, frankly, many, many web publishers and retailers to enhance the data that they collect with third-party products. Oftentimes these are actually companies that used to be in the mailing list business, and now they are in the business of having massive databases of demographic and consumer information. So here's an example. I'll, I'll read the relevant information from the slide. This is uh, from the website of a, a company called Newstar Marketing. Um, and here's what Newstar says about their, their data product. In today's connected world, where customers move rapidly across devices and touch points, it's time to stop guessing and start knowing with accurate and verified customer identity data. Over 150 million households compiled, verified, and enhanced with 450 fields of demographic, behavioral, financial, property, segmentation, and geographic attributes. Obtain a complete consumer profile of all US households with their names, addresses, phone numbers, demographics, and more. So this is a product that is marketed um, as something that you can take your customer database, your user database, your tracking database, reconcile it with Newstar's data, and enhance it so that you, you may have an email address, you may have an IP address, you may have a tiny little bit of information, pass it against Newstar's database, and all of a sudden you have a complete picture of addresses demographics, and more. They're not alone. Um, this is a screenshot from a marketing video for another tool called Adobe Audience Manager. And um, what you'll see in the, in, in the left-hand pane there is uh, a, a series of facets, um, demographic facets like age, income, gender, purchases, social. And Adobe Audience Manager um, their tool can be enriched with data from a company called Axiom. Um, Axiom boasts, quote, comprehensive consumer data on approximately 250 million US addressable, addressable consumers. 
there's more. Um, Oracle, uh, Oracle Identity Graph. Um, Oracle Identity Graph, quote, ingests massive amounts of IDs across cookies, login, household, email, and mobile ad IDs. The Oracle Identity Graph can reach over 90% of people online in the US and in markets that matter internationally. Everyone. So in all likelihood, advertisers and social networks aren't listening to you. They're just combining such an incredible mountain of data that they know exactly who you are, what your buying habits are. Shout out to Minnesota native Tom Wamsgans. Um, unless they are listening, of course, and Facebook actually did have a, a program where they were using, when you, you could opt into turning on a feature where while you were typing a status message, it would activate the microphone and could auto-populate whatever song or television show or you were, uh, you were watching or listening to. So this is creepy, right? And this is, goes totally against our notion of professional ethics. This is not anything that, that libraries would, would want to be a part of. We protect users' rights, right to privacy in information seeking, in uh, resources consulted or acquired. And this is why there are few places I'd rather be working on the web than in libraries, where I, I get to uphold these professional values. So at, at long last year, I do want to pivot to e-resources. And um, with all due respect to our conference organizers, I am going to hyphenate this. Um, uh, I. As I mentioned, I'm not an, an e-resource librarian. I've spent some time uh, looking at e-resources. And um, based on my, uh, my research, I have uh, something surprising to report to you. And that's that e-resources are websites. <laughs> but I mean like those other websites. So earlier this year, I did a, a research project um, and looking at what's actually, the code that's actually present on uh, academic publisher platforms. How did I learn about Newstar, Adobe Audience Manager, and the Oracle Marketing Cloud? Because these tools are present on library publisher platforms. Um, so in this uh, piece that I wrote and a presentation that I gave at the Coalition for Networked Information meeting this spring, um, I looked at uh, the 100 most frequently accessed articles uh, through the University of Minnesota Libraries Twin Cities proxy server over the past couple of years. Um, in those 100 articles, I, I found that there were 15 different platforms represented. And so I took a, an example uh, from each of those 15 platforms and looked at the, the code there to see what, what I could find. And in this write-up and in that presentation, I didn't name the platforms. Um, but because it's just us friends here, just us Midwesterners <laughs> here, um, and because it's been like six months and surely they've, they've cleared up their acts by now, I'm going to try to do a little demo. Um, uh, which I acknowledge is a dangerous thing to try to do in a presentation. Um, but we're going to look at some, uh, some articles here. So um, somebody uh, shout out your favorite DOI. <laughs> I, thought, I thought you all were resource librarians. <laughs> all right. Um, so uh, I'm going I'm to show you a couple of the articles that, that I analyzed here. And we're going we're gonna to take a look together. So uh, let's see you go. All right. So this is one of the articles most frequently accessed through the University of Minnesota Library's proxy server. This one happens to be a, uh, what's the journal there? Psychonomic Bulletin and Review. It's on the Springer Link platform. Um, and I am going to open up that inspector um, like I was showing in the screenshot earlier. So I'm going to make this as big as I can. Um, that's pretty good. All right. So. I want to uh, emphasize again, this is super easy. Any of you could do this. You could be doing it right now. Um, I'll, I'll also point out, so I am, um, we're on the universe, I'm on the University of Minnesota's uh, network. Uh, I am 
IP authenticated here. Um, and so I'm getting as sort of clean a, a, an experience accessing this article as I, I can be. Um, thank you uh, to the electronic resource librarians at the University of Minnesota Libraries. Um, so I've opened up the inspector here and there's a number of tabs across the, the top. Um, I'll show you elements is where you can see the source code of the page. I'm gonna come over here to sources. Because this, this shows you, this is all the places that code on this page is being called from. Um, and why this is important is because, as I mentioned earlier, any server um, that has code that's present on this page gets to see everything. They get to see the contents of the page, they get to see my search queries, they get to see my IP address, they get to see my browser fingerprint, they get to see what I click on. Um, and so here Springer is sharing my reading habits. Um, with Google, of course, um, and they have, there's a lot of different Springer servers here, as you might expect. They've got their you know, authentication server, they've got their own analytics server, things like that, and then there's a whole bunch of stuff that I, uh, krxd.net, um, that I have learned is a company, is uh, Crux Digital, um, which is an advertising and uh, metrics company that has been purchased by Salesforce. So this is now part of the Salesforce digital marketing platform. Um, and so uh, that's who gets to learn about what I'm doing on this site. Um, likewise, moatads.com, I think we can expect uh, what that is. It's also worth pointing out every one of these uh, servers that is, has code on this page, they can turn load more code it's not gonna appear here necessarily. Um, and what we don't see is what is happening server side on each of these services with the data that they're collecting. We can only guess. Um, I'll go over here too, there's another tab here. And the application tab is where you find the cookies. Um, and let's see here, who's setting a cookie here? Oh, there's krxd.net, Crux Digital. Um, and here, oh gosh, KUID, I can guess what that is. Uh, that I, I'm guessing is a user identification hash that Crux Digital is assigning to me so that they can track my behavior here. I, that's good for another six months. Um, so uh, unless I clear my cookies out of this machine, um, uh, that is going to be, uh, connected to my browsing habits for the next six months. And of course, that cookie might be associated with the browser fingerprint on the server side, so that even if I do wipe my cookies and they see the same browser fingerprint, they might connect it back to the same user ID anyway. So that's great. Um, all right, let's look at another one here. All right, uh, so here we've got the Journal of Pediatric Pulmonology um, uh, from Wiley. Um, once again, I'm gonna pull up my inspector and see what kind of nefarious nonsense is going on here. So sources, um, got a, a whole bunch of good ones here. So uh, there's Adobe. Remember I talked about Adobe Audience Manager earlier. Uh, here, this time we get Facebook. Um, I'll point out here again that if I visited this website um, with a Facebook cookie in my browser from a previous visit to Facebook, the fact that Facebook uh, it code is being loaded on this page means that Facebook can read cookies that they have previously set even on other sites. And so they are able to directly tie my behavior here to my Facebook, uh, my Facebook user ID through that cookie, assuming that I authenticated against Facebook at some point or otherwise gave them enough little tidbits of information that they can connect my, my identity. Um, some of these are, uh, are a little more innocuous. I'll just point out CloudFront. Um, this is a, a, a CDN peering service. This is to speed up um, delivery of, of assets. Worth noting, though, that even these uh, less nefarious things, ReadCube, for example, Crossref, you know, we tend to have a fairly decent um, opinion of those services. We know them, they're library thing. Uh, they, but they can just as easily read, store, analyze all my behavior on this site. Um, Google Ads. Um, 
add this. Oh, we're going to talk about that. <laughs> um, I do want to point out here, though, I'm going to go back here into the cookies. Um, oh, I didn't get it this time. Um, in previous testing, going between these articles, uh, I was getting another Crux Digital cookie. Actually, maybe I'm not getting a Crux Digital cookie because I already have one okay. from the last article that I went to. So we can assume Crux uh, code is being loaded on both of these pages. Um, they, they have already connected uh, my use between these two articles. All right, we're gonna do one last one here. All right, plus one. Um, and here's where I want to point out the stakes of, of what we're talking about here. This happens to be one of the most frequently accessed articles on campus, probably because it's in a syllabus or something like that. But let's point out the, the topic here and the kind of research that someone might be doing about their own lives or a loved one's life um, or a patient's life that would lead them to an article like this. Uh, Stigma of addiction and mental illness in healthcare. This one happens to be about dentistry. Um, and uh, I find myself asking, is this what users expect? Is this what we as librarians expect? That when someone comes to our resources to read about uh, mental illness and stigma in, of addiction in healthcare services, that all these services get to know about it. So here again, a bunch of Google. Um, this time uh, we get Twitter. Um, so if you've got a live Twitter cookie in your browser from a, uh, another tab or another window or another day, um, Facebook again, uh, Google again, um, all these uh, sites get to know about your reading behavior. Let's see if there's any interesting cookies just in case. Yeah, there's Facebook's cookie, Twitter's cookie. Um, so they're going to hold that here. And so even if you don't have a live Facebook cookie or Twitter cookie in your browser, this cookie is going to sit there. And if tomorrow or next month or I don't know, how long is this good for? Uh, that's good until January 2020. So if any time between now and January 2020 you do visit Facebook, this is going to connect back um, and your, your behavior, your look at this article is going to be recorded. All right. Go back to the slides here. Um, and now I'm going to skip through all the slides that I put in here as screenshots just in case the demo didn't work. <laughs> all right, so here's what I found when I looked at these 15 platforms. On average, each platform had 18 different third party assets being loaded on the article page. The median was 10. Um, there was only one that had none. Um, Inform Pubs Online uh, was the, the publisher there, the platform there. Uh, there was one that had over 100. And I found a total of 139 distinct third-party assets being loaded across these 15 platforms. Four of the 15 had Facebook code. Four of the 15 had Newstar code. Four of the 15 had Oracle Marketing Cloud code. These are not the same four, by the way, in each, in each case. 14 of 15 had Google code. 11 of 15 had Add This code. Add This is a social media sharing widget that also just happens to be a vector for uh, sharing user behavior with Newstar, Adobe, Oracle, Google, and two dozen other advertising and, and marketing companies. Uh, this is not what I expected or what I had hoped to find. Um, and so I want to talk a little bit about the landscape that we find ourselves in here today with academic publishers. Um, have, have any of you read this, this paper, this Sparked Landscape Analysis paper? A couple of you. I can't recommend this enough. This paper crystallized for me, and again, this will be linked in the, in the slides, it's crystallized for me uh, the landscape that we find ourselves in um, with, with academic publishers. And I'm actually going to read some, some segments of it here because I think it's really powerful. Academic publishing is undergoing a major transition as some of its leaders are moving from a content provision to a data analytics business. Data about students, faculty, research outputs, institutional productivity, and more has potentially enormous competitive value. But its capture and use could significantly reduce institutions and scholars' rights to their data and related intellectual property. 
a set of companies is moving aggressively to capitalize on this data, often by exploiting the decentralized nature of academic institutions. These companies are no less hungry for data than Facebook or Google or Amazon. And I think it's important that all of us, especially all of you, have this in mind as we're entering into license negotiations and discussions um, with platform holders. And I think it's important that we have these things in mind as we look at things like the Coalition for Seamless Access, formerly known as RA21. Um, this is an effort to standardize uh, a method for direct user authentication against publisher platforms. Cutting out the proxy server and having users directly authenticate with, with uh, publisher platforms, thereby, maybe accidentally, maybe not, potentially providing the publisher with more detailed information about specific users. I think it's important that we keep this in mind when we look at things like Safari Books and the changes that they've made to user accounts um, and requiring individual user accounts um, for access to their service. And there's been some really good uh, writing and activism around this. Some of you may have seen this statement from Stanford and Ivy Plus, uh, I think specifically um, uh, prompted by Safari Books and some other things um, about their stance on patron privacy and database access. And I, again, I'm going to read a, a couple of, of excerpts here. So they say in this statement, many leading providers of digital content to libraries in North America are changing the way they provide access to library patrons. Instead of allowing anonymous access via well-established channels, these providers are increasingly seeking personally identifiable individual patron data. This approach is unacceptable. I agree. As research libraries, we do not sell patron data. We do not share it. We object to and reject subscription agreements that silently expose it to third-party interests, whether they be commercial or governmental. Do we, though? Can we? Can we protect library users' right to privacy and confidentiality? I'll say I don't know. I am not confident. We are in a terrible negotiating position with these platforms. But there are things that we can do. Um, you, all of you, this is within, within the power and skill set of everyone in this room to do the same kind of evaluations of your electronic resources that I've done here today. You can ask your publisher contacts why they're using advertising technology even on authenticated pages. Once you already know that a user has um, is authorized to read a publication, why are you showing them ads? Why are you trying to monetize those users when we're paying for that content? You can work to develop model license language that prohibits this kind of tracking. It's going to be a cat and mouse game. Um, it already has been. Thankfully, there are some other, uh, there's some other good work happening uh, by browser creators who are working to um, stop more of the very invasive and um, untraceable tracking that's happening. Um, but it's going to be really difficult. Um, so with that, on that uh, really uplifting note, um, I want to point you to, to a couple of resources that hopefully will be helpful to you as you, uh, I, I hope, take this information back to your institutions and start to think about this and, and work on it. Um, I'll point out, uh, I was uh, fortunate enough to be a part of this uh, National Web Privacy Forum. They put out a white paper and a, another document with some ideas for how we as a profession might, uh, might proceed here in terms of web privacy and analytics. Um, the Digital Library Foundation has this um, excellent advocacy action plan um, from their Technologies of Surveillance group. Again, that's linked here. I'd recommend it. And for a lot more detail about uh, what's happening on these publisher platforms, I would encourage you to read Cliff Lynch's ARL piece, uh, Reader Privacy, The New Shape of the Threat. Um, and with that, I think I managed to finish with three minutes left uh, so I can take like one question. 